And if you look to this habitat to the right, you'll see lots of tree-like structures, branches, platforms, and ropes. That provide a home for some monkeys. Right in the center, and on the rope, you can see a trio of Allen's Swamp Monkeys, a little family group of them. That is a species found among the marshy forests of Africa. They do love to climb, so that's what all of those ropes and climbing structures are for. Those Allen Swamp Monkeys also have another adaptation. They have webbing between their hands and their feet that makes them extra good at swimming. So along the bottom of this habitat, you might see some rivers and water features. That allows the monkeys to use their natural swimming skills. They even share their habitat with a spot next to otter, who lives on the other side of the pathway. Sometimes the monkeys and the otter interact with each other, splashing each other. The monkeys practicing their hunting skills. Don't worry, they don't actually hunt the otter. But in the wild, Allen swamp monkeys might hunt little animals like fish. And some of those monkeys we're seeing, they were actually rescued from wildlife trafficking. Unfortunately, that is the illegal selling of animals as pets or as meat, but we were able to provide a home for some of those animals rescued from those situations so they can have a safe place to raise their own family. And as we start to leave the rainforest behind, we're headed towards the coast. And if you look to the left, you'll start to see and probably smell some more flamingos. The ones to the left of the bus are a different species than the ones we saw at the entrance. These ones over here are called American flamingos. And they are the most colorful species of flamingo, mainly found in parts of Central America, throughout the Caribbean, and also the parts of uh, the top of South America. And these flamingos are the most colorful species. Anybody know why they are pink? Shrimp is correct. I heard somebody say shrimp. And over the course of a few years, flamingos gain the pigment of the shrimp into their feathers. So they're not born pink, but over time, they kind of gain that color from their food. Also, next to the flamingos, to the left is one more type of water-loving bird. Those are a bunch of cormorants hanging out in the center nesting structure. And just in front of those cormorants, you'll see a yellow sign shaped like a kangaroo. That marks kangaroo bus stop number two. So the kangaroo bus is a hop-on, hop-off bus service. It has four different stops. You can use it as transportation. It's also completely included with your ticket. So take advantage of that kangaroo bus. There are four stops around the zoo. I'll point out the other three as we drive by them. And it's especially useful to travel up many of our hills, one of which we're going to head up right now. And if you look to the left of the bus, between those trees, it's kind of hard to see, but there's a big tan building, very nondescript. But that building is our first animal hospital that was built all the way back in the 1920s. And when it was built, it was the only one of its kind in the U.S. So over the past nearly 100 years, there have been some incredible stories to come from our animal hospital. And one of my favorites involves an orangutan named Karen. Karen was born during the zoo in 1992. And when she was only two years old, our veterinarian discovered that she had a heart murmur and a penny-sized hole in her heart. That required open-heart surgery for her to survive. That kind of surgery has never been done on an orangutan before, but that did not stop our veterinarians. We partnered up with local heart surgeons from UCSC. They worked very hard with our team here, and they were successful. Karen had that open heart surgery, and she is actually still alive today, 31 years old. So make sure you go to the orangutan habitat by the entrance of the zoo. Say hi to Karen for me. If you start to look to the right of the bus, though, You'll notice we have some savanna habitats coming up. So just past those trees, there's a Grevy's zebra. And right in the middle is a very large antelope, the one with those spiral horns. That is called a common eland. They are one of the largest species of antelope on Earth, probably in the universe as well. <laughs> but antelopes come in all shapes and sizes. It's basically a broad, general term for a hooved animal with horns. So if you look to the right, these next few smaller animals are also antelopes. That includes the speak gazelle, the really little ones, and the lesser kudu, who have those thin white stripes all along their back, hanging out along that back wall. Both of the antelopes to the right are very vulnerable to predators. They are on the menu for lions, cheetahs, and hyenas. So in order to stay safe, they live in large groups. They're very social, and by keeping an eye on their surroundings, they can evade any predators. They might notice a predator that lives right across the street from them, but this is not an African predator. We're pulled up right alongside a polar bear plunge, and we are very lucky this morning because I do see a polar bear right next to us, kind of lying down, actually two of them lying down kind of in front of the bus, about level with uh, me from the driver's seat. 
Uh, and there's also another one all the way in the back half of the habitat sleeping on the rock. So we can actually see all three polar bears who live here. We have two females and one male. Um, they're all rescues. One of them named Chinook was rescued in the mid-1990s. Uh, and then the other two, Kaluk and Tuckeek, they're a brother and sister pair. They were rescued in the early 2000s. Unfortunately, all three of them were found orphaned too young to survive on their own. So we've been able to provide a home for them here. You might be thinking, how can polar bears survive in sunny San Diego? Well, they have a few adaptations to help them stay comfortable. That cold water is available to them to swim in all day long. Also, they have air conditioning indoors where they can spend their time resting, keeping cool. And polar bears are facing many challenges and changes in their natural habitats as well. Normally, polar bears like to live on sea ice, which is frozen ocean water. That sea ice is most common in the winter. Uh, that's when it is most likely to form. They'll live on that sea ice to raise their young and also hunt very successfully. Polar bears are the largest land carnivore. They are a very impressive predator. When they hunt, they like to do it from the ice. It's harder to hunt in the water. But when the ice melts away in the spring and summer, it makes it difficult for polar bears to survive. They often have to swim for incredibly long distances, finding land or any remaining ice, uh, often fast for long periods of time as well. And this is an issue that polar bears are facing because the ice is not growing back in the winter as much as it used to. It is declining dramatically over the past several decades. So we have a few different partnerships to help out these beautiful bears. One of them pretty recently is with U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service where they are using laser technology to measure pol polar bear health, measure their body mass, make sure they're getting enough food and surviving okay. And lasers are good because it allows us to do it in an unobtrusive way. We don't actually have to get close to them. We can do it from a very long distance and not uh, disrupt their behavior. So that is one of the projects we're working on. We've had researchers in Alaska to help them out. We've also developed different collar tracking technology with our polar bears here. One of our polar bears, Tatik, sometimes wears a collar around uh, their neck to track their activity, see how much of their time is spent walking, running, swimming, and resting, and then we can use that information to determine a polar bear's needs during the day, make sure that the wild polar bears are having the same amount of activity and doing okay in their natural habitats. So if, again, we're very lucky to see these polar bears. Uh, and I'll linger here for just another couple moments, get any last photos or videos of these two very close to us. But I don't want to spend too much time here because there are a bunch of other really exciting things to come down the road. I want to make sure we can spend some time with other animals as well. So get any last photos, start making your way back to your seats, and then we'll continue up the hill. But again, this is pretty rare. Probably about 70 or more percent of the tours I give have no polar bears visible at all. So we're going to slowly continue to start moving up this hill. Make sure you are holding on to a seat. And as we start to leave the polar bears behind, we're heading back towards the African savanna habitat for a few more animals, a few more antelopes to be specific. So coming up on the right is an antelope called the Bondabon. Probably not the most well-known species, but at one point they were one of the rarest in all of Africa. That is not the case anymore, though. There was a Bondabon National Park established in the early 20th century to help them out, and they're doing pretty well because of that. A little bit further up the hill to the right is an antelope called the Southern Escarina. This one gets its food from the trees, so you can see how he has that long neck. Using that long neck, he's standing up on his hind legs to grab leaves and branches from the trees in the savanna. The final species on the hill to the right, this is not an antelope nor an African animal at all. This is called a Chacoan peccary, found in South America. They look a lot like pigs, but they're not even related to pigs. Uh, they're their own type of animal, found in South America. And as we reach the top of the hill, there's a few more South American species up here. The Sky Fari is also traveling right above us, so that's another transportation system you can take advantage of. It is included with your admission. So the Sky Fari is a lot of fun. From here, it will bring you to the other side of the zoo. There's one more attraction in this area. To the right of the bus is Mowgli's 4D Jungle Adventure. It's our 4D theater. It's a really cute film that immerses you into the jungle with water and wind and 3D glasses. It is an additional charge, but it's a cute film. A great way to get out of the sun for a little bit, too. The animals that live here, such as the mountain lion habitat to the left and the main wolf habitat up ahead to the right, they're pretty elusive. At this time of day, they're most likely going to be sleeping and hiding. That is because the species that live over here are crepuscular. The word crepuscular means that they are most active at dawn and dusk. 
So if you're staying all day today, maybe come back to this area around 5 or later. Uh, that's a good time to see these animals out and about. If you look to the left of the bus, though, you can see kangaroo bus stop number 3. And just past kangaroo bus stop number 3, we have some more unique plant life. Our carnivorous plant greenhouse is just to the left of us over here. And we also have a pollinator garden that we grow, where there's local flowers and plants to attract local pollinators, like butterflies. I even see one of them flying around right now. And I love to point out those gardens because they make great inspiration. If you have a backyard, front yard, balcony, patio, anywhere outdoors to grow some plants, Look into growing native and pollinator plants uh, to wherever you live. Help out your own backyard. This whole next area of the zoo we are entering is called Elephant Odyssey. An elephant odyssey is an odyssey through time. It is specifically dedicated to an era called the Pleistocene era that existed from about 10,000 years ago to two and a half million years ago. So we're, we're going to be meeting some modern day relatives of species that are now extinct. The first animal to the left is kind of perched up on the branches and rocks. There's two all the way in the back corner, another one kind of a little bit higher up. There are very little critter. These are called rock hyrax. And they have a pretty well-known close relative. Anybody want to guess what the rock hyrax is related to? Raccoon? That's a good guess. They kind of look like little raccoons or guinea pigs, rodents. I'll give you a hint though. It's not something you'd obviously guess. In fact, it's kind of a trick question. Believe it or not, the rock hyrax is a relative to the elephant. Pretty surprising, but they have similar characteristics, like similar teeth, similar feet, similar mammary glands, all of that goes into naming of relatives. If you look to the right of the bus, you'll start to notice a modern day relative to the now extinct American lion. These are, of course, the African lion, some of the most iconic animals in the entire zoo. So the one on that platform to the right, her name is Miss Ellen, and she is the lioness, the female. The one right underneath her on the rock back there is our male, Ernest. With that impressive <laughs> mane, lions are the only big cats that can grow manes, and they use it to assert dominance over each other, especially males when competing for mates or for territory. Lions are by far the most social species of big cat. Anybody know what a group of lions is called? A pride, you are correct. Our pride of lions has these two. <laughs> these two are a brother and sister pair. So Ernest and Miss Ellen were born together in the same litter back in 2014. They were born at, at our other location, the Safari Park in Escondido. And the two lions right now are doing very important lion behavior, sleeping. Lions sleep for up to 20 hours a day sometimes. The reason is because it takes a lot of energy to be a lion. They are yet another crepuscular animal, more active at dawn and dusk. When they hunt, they do it. When it's darker out, lions have very good eyesight at night, which gives them a nice advantage over their prey. And they also do it in groups. Being social allows them to successfully go after their prey together, cornering them, making them easier to get. Just next door to the lion lives another species of big cat. This one is much harder to spot as they, much like tigers, have very good camouflage. So start looking right in the middle, up on that center platform underneath the tree. See if you can find the jaguar. Do any of you know what a group of jaguars is called? A group of jaguars is called a football team. Because there's no group name for the animal. They are solitary. The one in the middle of this habitat, her name is Nidiri. She is our one and only jaguar. If you're still in trouble finding her, look right in the center, right? In the middle of those trees, you can see how her spots help her blend into the shadows of all of those leaves and rainforest plants that they would live in. Because jaguars are a flagship species of our Amazonia conservation hub. They are found throughout South America, Central America, most often in the rainforest, but they can be found in several other types of ecosystems as well, being a top predator in South and Central America. Although they're pretty small, especially in Deere, she's only about 80 pounds. Do not let that deceive you. Jaguars have the strongest bite force of any big cat, which gives them the nickname Skull Crusher. <laughs> Definitely an animal you want to keep your distance from in the wild. They hunt all sorts of animals, from fish to chacoan peccaries to even tapers and capybaras, which actually live just up ahead next door. But don't worry, they are protected in their own habitat. So these are some more South American animals. And then right behind the trees, you can also get a glimpse of the world's largest land animal today. That would be the African elephant. So there's lots of animals to see in just this one little section. The capybara is a rodent, the world's largest rodent, with that light brown fur underneath the tree. 
the elephant is, of course, that very large animal with those tusks in the trunk reaching up for some food right now between the trees. The bear's tapers are the two animals with that dark brown fur that are resting along the back fence over there. So lots to see. I'll very slowly drive on by this section. I think I'm going to spend most of our time talking about the elephants, though, because they are one of my favorite animals. They are uh, the largest land animal on Earth, as I said. So being so large, they eat lots of food, between 150 and 330 pounds of food in a single day. The three elephants who live here, all of them are African savanna elephants. And you can see Shaba, the first of which is foraging for some food with her trunk, reaching up high, grabbing some of that plant life. The elephants are herbivores. They exclusively eat plants, leaves, branches, trees, hay, fruits and vegetables if they can find any as well, basically anything that they can get their trunks on in their habitat. And that's why this habitat is designed with all sorts of nooks and crannies for those elephants to explore. We want them to use their problem-solving skills, foraging for food, much like they would in the wild. So some of those items you see, those big plastic items and balls and donuts and all sorts of weird objects, those are kind of like puzzles. The elephants can move them around with their trunks, finding the best way is to forage for that food. And Shaba is our female elephant. The next two are both males, and hopefully they'll be visible a little bit further down the road. There are several more elephant habitats as we pass by this building. This building to the right of us is called the Elephant Care Center. You may remember the hospital I pointed out is all the way on the other side of the zoo. Not very easy to get to for an elephant. So we built this facility to the right. This is where we can bring our veterinarians directly to work with the elephants, do regular day-to-day -day checkups, looking at their ears, giving them elephant pedicures, even weighing them on a massive scale. And I got to tour the Elephant Care Center a little bit earlier this year. I got to stand on that scale with a bunch of my coworkers. There were about 40 of us who gathered on that scale together, and all of us combined weighed 6,000 pounds less than any of the elephants here. So that just puts it into perspective. 40 people combined weigh less than a single elephant. And hopefully we'll get to see some more elephants down the road. Continue looking to the right. Sometimes they might be behind the Elephant Care Center at this time of day. Sometimes it might take more work to get the habitats ready for our elephants. As I said, they eat quite a bit of food. So I'll slowly be driving on by. Uh, we'll do a quick glance behind us, see if the males are by the Elephant Care Center at the moment, or they also might be in front of us. There is one more area ahead. So we'll keep on looking. Hopefully we'll get a glimpse of those elephants. And if not, definitely take note of Elephant Odyssey. It's this whole stretch of pathway you've driven through. Uh, there's so many cool animals that you can see from the pathway. But I do have my fingers crossed. And as we get to this final stretch of elephant habitat, continue looking to the right. And yes, it looks like we're in luck. They're going to be right next to us. At least one of them is. So we have two males, as I was saying. The one right next to us over here is Sunzu. And he lives here with his half-brother, Nepo, who currently might be in another area at the moment. But the two of them live in what is called the Bachelor Herd, and that is a smaller group of young male elephants. Sunzu here is 12 years old, Nepo is 11, so they're still pretty young. They are still growing. And because of that, they uh, can spend the time with each other, continue to grow and develop, and once they become dominant enough, they can rejoin a matriarchal herd, have some offspring of their own. That will usually happen when a male elephant is between 25 and 30. That's when they're most dominant, so these two still have a ways to go. Sunzu over here is waving his ears back and forth. That means he's about to take off. Everybody watch as he starts to fly away. I'm just kidding. Elephants flap their ears to cool off. It kind of serves as a gigantic fan to keep their back nice and cool. But there's also a lot of blood vessels within those ears. So by flapping them back and forth, they can cool off the blood in those vessels to cool off the rest of their body. You also might notice lots of mud and water along the habitat. Soon soon sometimes might grab a handful with his trunk, throwing it along his back to serve as a natural sunscreen and keep his body cool as well. <laughs> and as he was walking away from us, I don't know if you noticed, but it was probably pretty quiet. Despite being so large, elephants are virtually silent when they walk around. They have a nice layer of tissue on the bottom of their feet, five toes like we do, that are kind of permanently in a tippy-toe structure. So all of that makes them very quiet when they walk around, but although we cannot hear elephants, they can hear each other. They have some of the best low-frequency hearing of any land animal, and they can even use their footsteps as a form of communication, hearing herds from several miles away. Continuing past our elephants, 
Here's another pretty impressive animal, one that is domesticated, the dromedary camel. So start to look to the right for that animal with that one singular hump. That's what makes a dromedary a dromedary. That's the term for a one-humped camel. There's also two humped camels called Bactrian camels. But dromedaries are the most common type. They're the ones that you think of when you think of camels in Egypt or across northern Africa and the Arabian Peninsula. Any of you know what that hump is made out of? It's made out of fat. So it's long-term fat reserve storage that they can use to access when they go for about a week without water and over a month without food. That is how long they can survive without those resources. And there's one last animal here in elephant oddity. This one is another species of bird, one of the most impressive birds in my opinion, the California condor. <laughs> So start looking for a pretty large species with that beautiful bald head. I see one of them perched up on the rock. Uh, there might be a second one somewhere around the habitat, maybe along the ground, searching for food. The California condors are scavengers. Oh, you can also see a common raven right over there. Pretty familiar looking bird. Uh, they are also scavengers, so ravens and crows have very good senses of smell, and condors will use that to their advantage, finding ravens following them for food because California condors eat animals that are already dead. So they don't hunt them, they're kind of like the cleanup crew of their ecosystem. This is an animal that we have a very close connection with. Unfortunately, in the 1980s, their population dropped to about 22. 22, that is fewer condors than there are people on just the bottom half of this bus. So they came very close to extinction, but we partnered up with the, our friends at the LA Zoo and US Fish and Wildlife to breed the California condor, raise them, and then reintroduce them into the wild. Over the last 40 years, it's been a lot of trial and error, lots of hard work, but it's also been pretty successful. Today, there are over 600 California condors, and hopefully we get to a point where they no longer need our help. That is the goal. Just past those California condors is Cape Rue bus stop number four, so that's to the right. Keep that in mind if you're riding that hop-on, hop-on transportation bus later today. And that will bring us back towards a few more African savanna habitats up ahead. We've already seen several savanna animals, from the elephants to the lions, but those were all very large. And there's several smaller savanna species, such as the meerkats coming up on the right. And meerkats, smaller size, makes them very vulnerable to predators. So one of the adaptations they have to keep each other safe, we can actually see right now. Do you see that meerkat standing up on those hind legs? They are acting as the sentry, the security guard, keeping an eye on their surroundings. If that one sees a threat or any danger nearby, they have several specific sounds depending on what the threat is. One sound could mean there's a snake. Another sound could mean that there's a bird. We've even noticed the meerkats here very cautious when they see a plane or a blimp up above them because you can never be too careful when you are a prey species. And just past those meerkats, we have another type of ecosystem in the savanna where smaller prey species can seek refuge. So this area to the right with all of the rocks and boulders forms a kopi. Kopis are big rocky habitats in the savanna. The rock hyrax we saw earlier at the very beginning of Elephant Odyssey fell it on those rocky habitats. If you look across from the kopi to the left of the bus, you'll start to see some of our banana trees. We also have some dragon fruit, sugar cane, and guava, even coffee. So that's an example of some plants that humans can eat. But our animals also have very specialized diets that we have to keep in mind. So down the hill to the right of the bus, you'll see lots of African plant life, including these green, thorny-looking trees. Those are called acacia trees. There are many types of acacia. It is found across the African savanna, and it's a popular source of food for giraffes. You cannot get acacia from the grocery store, so we grow it here ourselves. Much of the plants that we grow here is food for our animals. We grow all sorts of types of acacia, bamboo, ficus trees, and even eucalyptus. Anybody know the animal that eats eucalyptus? Koalas! You're correct. If you look to the right, you'll even start to see our colony of koalas coming into view. They spend virtually their entire life in those trees. That's where they get their food and also spend their time in sleeping. The two most important things in a koala's life are eating and sleeping. Because the food that they eat takes a lot of energy to digest, so they need to sleep between 18 and 22 hours a day. <laughs> so if you ever see an awake koala, it's a pretty exciting sight. And we have quite a few of them. About 32 koalas live here, the largest colony in the world outside of Australia. 
We're going to get another view of them soon, so I'll spend more time with the koalas later. But as we keep on moving down this roadway to the right is the urban jungle. So that's a great area if you want to see giraffes, hippos, cheetahs, uh, and also kangaroo bus stop number one is right down there. So keep that in mind, the urban jungle kind of in the bottom center section of your map. And if you're following along on your map, it might be hard to figure out where we are. So look to the left of the bus. You'll see that red circular sign with the number eight. And that's just one of dozens of map location number signs. They're all over the zoo. If you're ever lost, look around for those signs. Look on your map for the corresponding number. That will tell you exactly where you are. And if you don't have a map on you, we have a San Diego Zoo app you can download on your phone to so also navigate our ground. As we start heading down this hill, uh, you might notice lots of grotto-style habitats coming up. These are mainly home to bears. There are three different species of bears we'll be passing by their habitat. So let me know if you see anything. We got really lucky with the polar bears. Hopefully that luck will hold true as we head down this hill. And yes, start looking down along the bottom of this habitat for a thick, shaggy black coat of fur. He's kind of walking around looking for food along the bottom. He might kind of wander in and out of view. Uh, there he is starting to move further up. So this is a sloth bear. And look at this animal. Do you think that they are relatives of the sloth? If you think they are not, you are correct. They're not related whatsoever. But the person who named them back in the 1790s thought that they were. And the name has just stuck. So they're still named the sloth bear. Um, despite not being related to sloths, they are very good at climbing spending lots of time up in the trees to find their favorite food, which would be bugs. They eat lots of ants, termites, little insects with their straw-like snout that they can use to suck up all of those bugs. They're not the most well-known species of bear, but if you think of the Jungle Book, Baloo is a great example of a sloth bear that you might be familiar with. They are mainly found in parts of India and other areas in Asia surrounding India. So hopefully you get a glimpse of the sloth bear. I'm going to keep moving forward, so just make sure you are holding onto a handrail and we'll slowly continue moving. Keep on looking to the right, though. Be on the lookout for one of our sloth bears. There are two. Their names are Kartik and Shala. They were paired together as part of something called the Species Survival Plan. And that's something that is in place for many of the animals here, not just the bears. Uh, but it's kind of like a zoo dating app of sorts. So it allows us to match together different animals working together with a bunch of other zoos to find the best uh, matches for our animals, looking for genetic diversity, ensuring a healthy population, and boosting those endangered populations as well. So we'll see another example of that further down the hill. In the middle is a species that's another example of a rescued animal. These would be the North American grizzly bear. Pretty impressive looking. There's one of them crawling around right over here. Another one is in that back cave. These two grizzly bears, these two grizzly bears are a pair of brothers. Their names are Scout and Montana. Uh, they were rescued together from just outside of Yellowstone National Park. Unfortunately, the mom was teaching them pretty dangerous habits for survival. They were relying on dumpsters and garbage and trash as the main source of food. But the problem with that is it gets them really close to humans. When the large animals like these grizzly bears get close to humans, it usually ends up pretty badly for the bear. So it was returned as rescued these two would be their best chance at survival. Uh, this is also something that is preventable. If you have ever been out hiking or camping or have ever visited a national park around bears, you probably notice there's lots of action taken nowadays to help prevent bears from getting close to humans. A couple of weeks ago, I went camping in Yosemite National Park where they have black bears. And at my campsite, there was a bear locker just for us. Every campsite had one. That allowed us to store our food in an area where bears cannot get to it, keeping them away from us, keeping them scared of humans, hopefully, and preventing any bear and human conflict from happening. And these two grizzly bears, you might notice how different their habitat is from the sloth bear. There's a lot less climbing structures. Only grizzly bear cubs tend to climb up in the trees. Uh, for safety, but the larger adult grizzly bears don't do as much climbing. Uh, so you can see how their habitat reflects that they have a little bit of climbing structures, also lots of water, they do love to swim, and those caves and dens where they can stay nice and comfortable for their sleeping. And as we continue down the hill, there's one final species of bear. I like to think that we're saving the best for last because my favorite species of bear is up ahead. It would be the Andean bear. Start looking in the middle. These ones are another climbing species, so they spend most of their time up in the trees. They are considered arboreal. 
And we have actually have a whole family group of these Andean bears. So up on that center platform is all three Andean bears who live here, a mom with two cubs. The mom's name is Alba, so two cubs are a brother and sister pair named Francisco and Suyana. And they were born nine months ago on December 10th. So they're growing up quite quickly. Uh, they stay in the den for the first three months of their life. And then after about three months of just staying in the tent, then very closely with mom, they start to leave and climb around those trees, learning how to be an Indian there. They'll probably stay with mom until they're about a year and a half old. That's when they become mature enough to leave and go off on their own. Because Andean bears tend to be pretty solitary outside of raising their young. And this is another example of that species survival plan. Very successful in this case. Alba was matched up with a male Andean bear named Turbo. Uh, they have had three cubs together, these two and a third one who was born about three years ago. It's believed there are less than 2,000 Andean bears remaining in the wild, so it's very exciting that we have these cubs. They are the only bear species found in South America, and once again, they're my favorite that live on this hill. I could honestly watch them all day long. But I do not want to keep you on the bus all day long, and it's already a pretty long tour, so I'm slowly going to continue leaving those Andean bears behind, but I'm really glad we got a little glimpse of them. We are going to head back into some more rainforest habitats, and lots of the zoo is dedicated to the rainforest, but it is for a very good reason. Rainforests are some of the most biodiverse places on Earth. They make up only 6% of the land on this planet, but contain over half of all terrestrial or land-dwelling wildlife. So many of the animals we've seen live in the rainforest, such as the jaguar and even the Andean bears, but these are all animals that need our protection. Coming up on the right is another type of monkey called a Francois Langer, the ones with the mohawk. Uh, there's a couple of them back there. And these are all monkeys that are impacted by deforestation, destruction of the rainforest for different resources like paper products, wood products, and agriculture. These are resources that we as humans use all the time. So I just want to give us one more way to help make a difference, that is by looking for sustainable paper and wood products. There's an organization that makes this easy, they are called the Forestry Stewardship Council. They label products with the letters FSC and a tree and a check mark. And if you see it, the letters FSC, it means you are being sustainable with your paper products. I found it on toilet paper, paper towels, and cardboard boxes, just to name a few. So that's just one other way that you can help out wildlife at home. And as we're coming around this corner, if you look to the left of the bus, here's another little tip on navigating today. That big green bridge is very useful. There are elevators that take you from the bottom of the bridge to the top, and it will take you across the zoo. So that will save you a lot of time on navigating today. And to finish up our tour, we're going to be heading through Africa Rocks. And Africa Rocks is dedicated to a six specific ecosystems of Africa. We've seen a few of them already, like the Kofi, uh, but as we head up the hill, Think about these other ecosystems that are not the savannah. So the first of which is close to the coast. It is called the Cape Fine Box, the southernmost tip of Africa, where African penguins are found. So I do see a few of those African penguins hanging out along the beach. They are a penguin that lives in a warmer climate, pretty similar to ours here in San Diego. So they do very well outdoors here. And they're also a very social species of bird. Like most penguins, they spend their time in large colonies along the beach where they can raise their young, communicate, and also, most importantly, hunt for food. African penguins rely on the oceans to survive eating fish. As we continue a little bit further up the hill past those penguins, there's a stage to the left of us that is home to a presentation today at noon. So there will be three different presentations across the zoo for our wildlife. You can meet some of our animal ambassadors that one is at noon, there's a second one at 1 p.m. in the Wildlife Explorers Base Camp, and a third one at 2 p.m. in the Weather Boys Ball. And all of these are labeled on your map if you want to figure out where to go for them. But that's just a great way to see some of our animal ambassadors up close to animals that you wouldn't see on habitat anywhere else. And as we continue further up after the rock, this whole area is a really best experience from the pathway to get more of a behind the scenes perspective from the bus. I do encourage you to come back to me later, maybe come through here after the tour and check out that new next presentation. And as we continue up the hill, we're going to leave Africa and head back towards the Australian outback. So if you missed the koalas earlier, we have another chance to see them. Start looking into the right of the box. And I mentioned how we have the largest population of koalas in the world outside of Australia.
Well, that number is growing. You see, we have a few Joey's or baby koalas that were born pretty recently. And what I love about Joey is that when they are first born, they are only about the size of a large jelly bean. So koalas are marsupials. That means that their moms or the females have pouches so they can raise their young. And much like most other marsupials, such as kangaroos, wallabies, and wombats, baby koalas are not more fully developed. So because they are so small, they go straight from their mother's birth canal into the mother's pouch where they live for the first six months of their life just in that pouch. So start looking to the right of the bus. You might see a few more of those koalas as we round this corner, making our way back towards the uh, city's plaza and then to the unloading dock. So our tour is soon going to be coming to an end, but I hope you enjoyed getting a glimpse of some of these animals here with me. It's always a treat to get to share the zoo with all of you. And I also hope that you have been inspired in some way to make a difference, because we have seen quite a few endangered and critically endangered species, but we have the chance to help them out. Simple steps at home, like growing native pollinator plants, uh, leaving no trace and looking for bear-proof containers when you are out in nature, or lastly, trying to find that FSC logo on paper and wood products. Those are just a few simple ways that you can help out and make a difference, ensuring the survival of all of the incredible species we share this world with. Just by you being here, though, you already are helping out. We are a nonprofit organization, so nothing we do would be possible without your support. And I want to thank you one more time for spending your day with us here. As we pull up to the unloaded dock, I will be helping you out. I'm going to open up the lower deck of the bus first, and then I will head right upstairs and open the upper deck for all of you folks up top. Remember to gather all your personal belongings, watch your step as you exit the bus, and if you have any questions, feel free to let me know. Once again, my name is Alex, and I'm going to answer the most common questions right now. Nearest restroom and stroller parking, they're both to the right once you exit the bus. If you want to head back to Africa Rocks, check out that presentation at noon, or check out the urban jungle with the giraffes and the hippos and cheetahs. 